Sir, 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 please stop. The room is full. You cannot enter. Please follow online at liveofwasdem.org. I'm sorry, those are the rules. Our next speaker did our first open source contribution in 1988, that's older than this building, to the GNU Emacs project. But today he's joining us live from the neighborhood of London in the UK to talk to us about how to make registers go way faster in Go. So this is Richmond Park, where I often come for a walk. Nice sunny day today. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Brian Borum, and I'd like to welcome you all to my talk on Finite Automata. It's kind of a complicated name, but I'll explain uh, why that's interesting. Um, some work I did optimizing the Go regex package, and I learned a, a huge amount about how it works inside, and I hope to pass some of that along and uh, maybe get you interested in exactly how it works. At Grafana Labs, I work on what we call the, the backend databases, and uh, principally three big open source projects. Uh, Cortex does metrics, Loki stores logs, and Tempo is for distributed tracing. So this particular story begins a few months back when my colleague Ed Welsh um, posted a message on Slack saying that uh, we had an overload situation. We had uh, queues filling up and about 300 CPUs in this case being um, maxed out by, by some query on the, the log system. Uh, another colleague, Cyril Tovena, managed to get a profile. Um, and it, it's a little bit complicated, but basically the, the big box in the middle is saying that 77% of all of that CPU was, was going into one function, and it's in the Go regular expression package. So uh it's not entirely unexpected we when we we're querying logs um we have some indexes to kind of narrow it down a bit but then basically you have to go line at a time and and look for the thing that you're trying to match so cyril uh found out that this particular 
um, high load was caused by this one regular expression. Um, let's take a step back and, and look at what exactly is a, a regular expression. Well, Wikipedia tells us it's um, used to express a search pattern in text. So, so that fits. We're kind of searching for things in, in log files or in, in metrics. And just a, a, a little example here. Um, if I wanted to find that phrase in the middle of the quick brown fox, um, and I expressed that as, as a regular expression, uh, QUI dot star FOX, then that would match the, um, the QUI part would match those letters, the, the FOX part would match Fox, and the dot star matches everything in the middle. So uh, I think probably most people in this uh, Go dev room would have uh, come across the, the basic concepts of regular expressions. They start out really simple, um, simple building blocks of, of a certain set of characters or one or more repetitions of things, but um, uh, can get pretty complicated. This is what uh, Ross Cox describes as a cacophony of bells and whistles that have been uh, added to those simple building blocks over the years. And um, so this is what a, a user would expect, a fully fledged regular expression package um, to implement. And uh, although the, the simple case uh, is quite often given as a you know a, a student exercise for an undergrad to program up in in a couple of weeks um the the production a production regular expression system implementing all of this and doing it in a bulletproof fashion is is years of work so i don't want to i don't want to take that away uh from uh, from anyone a lot of this work was done by by russ cox and the go uh, team and uh, it is a, a, a magnificent piece of engineering. Uh, I managed to s propose a few improvements, but um, nothing on the, the scale of the, the whole piece of work. So I don't really don't want to take that away from them. This is a view that's quite often used when describing how regular expressions work. The circles are states. We, we start in this state, and if we get a Q, then we can move to the next state. If we get a U to the next state, an I, and then in that state, we can loop round this arrow here, matching any character as many times as we like. And then if, when we get an F, we can move to this state, an O to this state. And if we get an X at that point, then we reach the final state, uh, and that's a match. We have matched the regular expression. So... This thing is, is known as an automaton. It's a, a little machine and it's just following very simple instructions. It is a finite automaton because there are a fixed set of states. And it is a non-deterministic finite automaton. So that's a bit complicated. And what that refers to is in a situation like this, um, from the middle state, if we got an F, we could actually take either path. And um, if you think in, instead of uh, quick brown fox, if, if I give it the string quick brown fifa for fox, then the regular expression would match all those extra Fs by going around this loop. Now there is no rule inside the machine saying which path to take in that state. Uh, it just turns out that if you did follow the right sequence of paths and reach the end, then that's a match. So that's a little bit weird uh, that we're defining a machine that somehow knows what to do without us saying how. Um, but that is the, the standard formalism. This is called a, a non-deterministic finite automaton or NFA. Um, and we'll see in a bit how that is uh, emulated by the Go runtime in order to actually run a regular expression. Moving back to Go, when you use a regex in Go, you have to call the compile function on it. And what that does is it makes a data structure in memory, which is basically a little program um, of an abstract machine. So 
the steps are all here, but but now they're all um, entries in a in a slice of instructions in this program. We can uh, take a little look at the definitions of of how that works inside the regex package. Um, so the program has, as I say, a, a slice of instructions and a, and a starting point. Um, each instruction uh, is here. It has an opcode. It has where it goes next and um, the runes that it matches. The opcodes on the right here, um, there's just 11 of them. Um, things like matching a rune, um, alternating between different cases, um, so everything you can express in the Go regular expression language gets encoded into these 11 instructions. And uh, then the, when you execute, when you, when you call match on the regular expression, um, it will walk this little program and uh, figure out if there's a match or not. So let's go back to that profile we saw earlier. And uh, just to remind us we're interested in the fact that this one function is 77% of, of all of those machines, 300 CPUs maxed out. Um, but it's really hard to work with, with 300 machines. So what I like to do is uh, construct a, a smaller test case and, in fact, a Go uh, benchmark. Benchmark as a concept is, is built into the Go test package. And uh, all you do is you write a function that begins with the name benchmark and takes this particular parameter. Um, we're going to run the meet of the benchmark uh, n times, where n is given to us by the testing framework. What it does uh, by default is tries to run the benchmark for about one second to, to kind of give a decent uh, average time. And then we have to do some setup. In this case, we're compiling a regular expression. Um, so we stop the timer around the setup. We don't want to time this part. Uh, and we're going to give it a, a string, which is a bunch of X's. So this, this represents the typical case in scanning logs, which is the, you're skipping over a lot of lines that don't match. And then there's, there's just a few that do match. My regular expression is a little bit simplified from the one in production, um, but uh, it's, it's basically the same structure. This bit of, at the beginning means um, case insensitive, uh, and then dot star foo dot star bar dot star. Um, and then you run your benchmark by saying go test a minus bench and uh, something that will will match. In fact, this is not a regular expression, but I've just given it the, the name of the benchmark. I typically, uh, I give this extra parameter minus run um, something that doesn't match. Otherwise, it, it will run all your unit tests uh, as well. And I, I don't want to see that in um, in the output. So I'm just, I'm saying don't, you know, don't match any, don't run any unit tests. Do run this one benchmark and take a CPU profile because I'm going to drill into this and store it in this file. So this is what comes out when you run the benchmark. Uh, we get a few lines of preamble and then one line per benchmark. It's got the name, uh, dash four means I ran it on a four core machine. Um, this is, is that N number, the number of times that it ran round the loop. And the benchmark framework comes up with that number to take the, the overall time uh, just over one second. Uh, by default, you, you can tell it to run for 10 seconds or whatever in, in uh, with the bench time parameter. Um, and then this number is, is how long each loop takes. It's, it's um, in this case, 4,123 nanoseconds per operation. So operation here means one time round that loop. So the next thing I would typically do when investigating something like this is uh, play around a little bit with the benchmarks, explore the, the space of um, what's going on. So take the whole program and just focus in on um, the regex that we're using and uh, the, the time, the benchmark result. Um, we had a suspicion that that, that first bit, the case insensitive, was, was the expensive bit. Um, so take that out. Uh, 
yeah, it goes faster, but really not a lot faster. Um, so that's interesting. Um, the dot star at the beginning and the end, because the only thing we want to do is match or not match, um, they don't actually make any difference. I mean, what they're saying is that uh, uh, dot star will match all the characters at the beginning and, and at the end. Um, but a match will match anywhere in the string anyway. So uh, just take a look at what happens if I, if I remove those. Wow. Uh, so we've gone from three and a half thousand nanoseconds down to 91 um, with a change that notionally makes no difference. So it was at this point that I really felt I was onto something and uh, there, there might be something in the code that I could um, figure out why that made such a massive difference, even though it, it really uh, didn't affect the outcome. Um, I carried on though. I mean, uh, let's see what happens if we uh, simplify it a bit further. Um, so that's weird. The Just a straight string foo um, goes pretty much the same speed as that much more complicated uh, foo dot star bar. Um, so let's take a look at the, the benchmark for that one. Well, it's still pretty much the same. It's in it's still in this um, backtrack routine. Um, so now we need to understand why that is and what, what the context of that is. It turns out there's actually three regex matchers in the Go regex package. One pass is for very simple cases where there's no ambiguity. If you think about the, the state diagram, then uh, this is for cases where you can move from state to state and it's always clear which arrow you take. The backtracking matcher uh, this one solves the problem of non-determinism by saying, well, whenever we have a choice, we're going to remember that point. We're going to try one of the choices and put the other one on a stack. And if it doesn't work out, then come back and do the other one. So that's uh, cheaper than the third one, but it, it has the problem that the stack of backtrack points can grow and grow and grow with the size of the input. The the third one then, I've called NFA here. Um, in the code, it, it's just under a function called match. But this one implements the full power of uh, a non-deterministic finite automaton by uh, tracking multiple threads of processing within the regexp. So it's, it's like uh, when you need to make a choice it, it, in, in that state, diagram, it fires off two threads. And the difference from the backtracking point is the um, the number of threads is finite in the number of states that if you find yourself in the, the same place again in the machine, then uh, you don't need to to add any more states. So it's it's always finite in the size of the regexp um, and not getting bigger and bigger and bigger in the size of the input, which is possible in the in the backtracking case. So I looked at the code for one pass and I realized that um, it's only meant to work in the case uh, where the, the regexp is anchored at the beginning. So this, this really uh, helps to cement the fact that it's unambiguous, that, that it always starts at the beginning of the string and um, matches a, a particular set sequence of things with no um, no backtracking. Um, however, when I tried that one, so so a little up arrow to anchor to the beginning of the string and then same same as before, foo, which if you remember was was about 90 nanoseconds. When you add the anchor, uh, in theory it should go through the simpler code, but it takes longer. It's gone up to 115 nanoseconds. Um, Check that in the profile. Ah, it's still running the back tracker, even though this this is a completely simple uh, regexp, completely unambiguous and anchored at the beginning. It's still firing up the backtracking machinery. So this was the first 
improvement I submitted to the goal project um, was to address the fact that it was not selecting the one pass matcher for this case. So here's my PR uh, that I posted, number 48748. Um, and it turns out Go, the Go project doesn't use uh, GitHub for reviewing PRs. Um, so your PR gets kind of mirrored in the system they do use, which is which is called Garrett. Um, and I don't want to go too deeply into it, but there's, there's the code um, that uh, we extend the set of cases that will go to, to the one pass matcher by um, allowing ones that have no alternates to, to go there. Um, there was actually a further change needed to to really optimize that case. But uh, basically after that, we, we're down now. So it was 115 before this one's down to, to 78 now. And, and that's against the, the 90 where we began. Um, so that's nice. You know, that's a little bit over 10% improvement. Um, what else can we get? So let's switch over to, to a different benchmark. This is one of the ones that was in the code already. Uh, looks very similar to the one I put in, but uh, it's just a, it takes us through a different code path. This one again in the one pass matcher. And um, when I run this one, it, it comes out 730 nanoseconds per operation per, per match. Uh, so it's a, quite a bit heavier in the code. Profile that. Uh, so we're in the one pass matcher. That's good. Um, we don't get a lot of detail there. You know, we basically most of the time is just in that one function. So next step in uh, trying to optimize your Go program, um, at least the way I do it, uh, take a look at the source code view. So let's walk through what we see in the source code view of a Go profile. Uh, it starts at the top with which function we're in. And then this number here is all the time measured while executing this function, which is, is pretty much everything that I was timing. And this number over here is, is just in this one function. So that the difference between them is, is any functions that you call out to. But uh, what stood out for me was, was this line here. Um, which is 170 milliseconds. So that's nearly a quarter of all the time in this benchmark. Um, and all it's doing is uh, assigning a variable. This, this variable inst is the instruction. Uh, so this is in our little program that, that implements the automaton. Um, and all it's really doing in the code is is creating a, a name to refer to the instruction so that we can use the the pieces of it more conveniently um we don't we don't need a, a variable we're not going to assign to it or anything like that but uh if you think back to to when we looked at the source code of the instruction the data structure earlier um this thing has has the opcode it has where does it go next and it has those those runes and all of that adds up to 40 bytes every time around this loop which which we execute at least once for each byte of input we're we're copying 40 bytes of instruction data that we really don't need to so i had to play around and came up with this this very simple change. This was another uh, PR that I posted to the Go project. Um, simply taking the address of the instruction so we can refer to it through a pointer instead of making a copy of it. Um, in this one benchmark, it, it brings the time down about 15% about overall. And um, nearly every benchmark speeded up by, by some amount because, because all of them are um, executing these instructions in the, in the automaton program. Um, so I got a nice kudos from uh, Brad Fitzpatrick there on, on the Go team. Uh, he liked it too, and that really made my day. So over the last few months, I've carried on looking at the, the Go regex code and uh, posted a total of, of five CLs to the project. Um, they're all listed there. And um, it's time for the big reveal. This is the uh, 
benchmark results. So what we're looking at here is um, the benchmarks that, that were already written for the regex package. And um, big picture, some of them like um, uh, these ones here come down 80, 90%. Um, a lot of them come down just a few percent, 10 percent or maybe even five percent uh, and a lot don't change like um, ones over here and the compilation benchmarks I never touched that uh, there's a couple that that show up as being a few percent slower um, those those were really really small calls they're like eight nanoseconds going up to eight and a half or something like that it's um uh, it is real that it's slightly slower because we, we check in a couple more things, but uh, it, it's probably not meaningful. So I would definitely recommend if uh, your project is speed dependent on regexps that uh, you take a look at what I've done. I'm really hoping uh, some or all of this work can go into the next version of Go. Um, but if not, I've made a repo, which is Grafana slash regexp, and you can import that. That's just basically a copy of the, uh, the Go project code with all these changes, um, on a branch called speed up. Uh, and I put a link there to the, um, the syntax definitions that, that we we're looking at earlier. So thank you for listening and I uh, hope you have a lot of questions for me now.